start now. So I want to welcome everybody again. I am so, so honored to have you. I wasn't sure how the response was going to be, but I'm so, so honored to have you. And I look forward to an exciting night. I always say it's just us talking about writing in a relaxed atmosphere. And I can see a number of writers too on the call. So I will be expecting us to just share ideas as we move on. And I, I trust this will be great. So my name is MFA. <laughs> Zoom says my name is Conversations on Writing, but that's not my name. My name is MFA and I'll be your host today. And as some of you already know, today I will be hosting two, I call them amazing, amazing young writers for me, you know, because I have a thing for people who write fiction because it's something I can't get my hands to doing. <laughs> and so I have immense respect for them. And I'm so excited that they get to be here to talk about not just their story, but I mean, the things that they do to help them to write and how we can all improve on the writing for us. So thank you so much. And um, I will just go ahead and introduce my guests for today. And that would be Lori, Lori Ous. Lori, can you just confirm if you can hear me? And I'm going to ask you to come on video. Okay, yeah, I can hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. All right, let's see your lovely okay. face. Amazing. <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us, Lori. Nanama, I'll call you author Lori. And then is author Bene, is he here? Yes, please. I can hear you. Okay. I'm going to ask you to come on video as well. Okay. All right. Great. It's good to have you. All right. All right. Okay. So this is what we are going to expect this evening. I'm just going to ask um, Laurie and Ben a series of questions about writing and all that. And then you also get the opportunity to ask them any question or to contribute to the discussion. We want to be talking about the writing journey, how we can start it, how we can, what we can do to make our stories sound better. And also to talk about some of the challenges that we face as young writers or writers in Africa for some people. And then I also said we have some surprise giveaways. And this is the surprise about the surprise giveaways. I'm not going to be the one to select the surprise, the winners for the giveaway. I'm going to leave that to author Laurie and author Bennett to choose their own people. Oh. So when it's all done, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so when it's all done, I'm going to ask you who you think you want to give the book to. I'm sure maybe based on some of the questions or some of the feedback, um, mm -hmm. we'll have a few people that can get a copy of your book for free mm -hmm. or something. It's a giveaway. So that's about it. So thank you very much. Let's just get into it. All right, so I'm going to start by introducing my people, my guests, and I will just give them. So let me start with Laurie. Born in the 1990s and living in Accra, Laurie loves to read, to write, to cycle, listen to music, and work out. She's still attempting to learn to play the guitar, like me. <laughs> and... <laughs> Her favorite thing, I think I started and then I think I've played it maybe like two or three times. The guitar is in the house. We don't use it for anything. Her ah. favorite thing to do is mm -hmm. to be still and enjoy nature with a pack of plantain chips within reach. Ha, huh, plantain chips, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so that's Lori for you, my plantain chips girl. <laughs> Author mm -hmm. Lori, good to have you. And then Bene, let's, this is Bene for you. So Bene is a product of adventure. He's a graduate of the Mo Isa Writing Workshop. And I'm going to ask you to talk about that, the writing workshop as well. His first book, which is Becoming and Other Stories, has been touted as the coming of age embodiment of brilliance. Bene's short stories have also been published in Larabanga, Kenke for Airways, and Waterbeds on a Lakeshore. His short story, Summer School, 
which appeared in the anthology Waterbirds on a Lake Shore, has been translated into French and Kiswahili. Yay! For the French <laughs> speakers. Ah, Laurie speaks French yeah. too. So do oh, I. <laughs> yeah, we do. So he was selected yeah. by the Goethe Institute as an Afro Young Adult author to represent Ghana at the 2019 Ake Arts and Book Festival. Yay! You are a star. He currently lives in Accra, where he splits his time between reading and dreaming of a better world with stricter laws. So here we are, we have our people for today, author Lauren, author Bennett, impressive, 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 impressive profiles. All right. So I'm going to start with you, Bene. And I would like you to tell us about how you started writing, your writing journey. How did you know that you could write or and how did it start for you? Okay, so... Uh... Funny story, I actually started writing poems way back in school. I think it, I was I was in GSS when I started, you know, was um, one of my favorite subjects was literature. And so after reading um, Kofi Awuno's poems and a few others, I thought, oh, let me just try my hands on them. So I realized that um, over the period um, through to SHS, I would find myself writing poems and doing some form of poetry. And it was a way to express um, my feelings, my, my whatever I was going through in those teenage years. And then also I got to the university and I was still writing poems, but um, I, I, I started reading a lot more um, novels and so, and, and short stories. I think one author that, uh, I started reading was Chimamanda Adichie, and um, I was so moved by her, yes, her, her, yeah, her writing that I felt that. Well, even backtrack before that, yeah. So I, I, I was writing poems, and a friend of mine told me that, oh, you are pretty good at, at this, so why don't you start a blog? So I hesitated for a while, and then eventually I said, let me just give it a shot. So I, I created a blog. And um, I never posted anything for months. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, later um, I said, I just put up one of the poems I had written and um, I shared it and the feedback was great, you know? And then I didn't start, like I said, so I started reading um, a lot more novels and I, a lot more short stories. And I also wanted to try my hands on that. And so that's how come I got into short story writing. The beginning was rough, but then I realized that I, I didn't. I realized that I loved writing fiction much more than poetry, and I stuck to the fiction. Yeah, that's really interesting because you know when I was thinking of this thing, one of the things that came to my mind was poetry. Whether we have like people who are genuinely interested in poetry, you know, I studied literature. And I hated yeah. studying poetry. I mean, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I know people like, well, so it, like, it's so melancholic to me when I think about it. Yeah. And so I, I always ask myself, I mean, do people out there genuinely like poetry? I mean, mm -hmm. are, are there people who just appreciate it? Or, I mean, they have to force literature students to learn it or something. Did you feel that there were people were receptive to the poems that you started? I mean, even compared to the stories that you write? Yes, I believe that certain people genuinely like poems, you know, and it, it, it's not for everyone. Just like um, people like short stories and novels. There's a, a, a particular category of people who are, I mean, they, they tend to look out for, I mean, poems and poetry, and they look out for poetry writers because that's what appeals to them. So I realized that with writing, you know, they are very, they are very different um, genres and you realize that no matter the spectrum you go to there's a, an audience for it you know mm -hmm. and if you are not exposed to them you would think that they do not exist so there's there's a large audience for poetry i would say wow that's great okay i'll talk about that later how about author laurie tell us about your writing journey and how you started mm -hmm. how did you know did you also love literature when you were in school <laughs> Was it natural yeah. or you had to? Yeah, I did. I did. 
But in, it's funny hearing um, the next story because I also started with poetry. And then I always say that, um, you know, most people you speak to who like to write will tell you that they started love, like they started with a love for reading. And it's, it's the same thing for me. It was a love for reading that, you know, later got me into a love for writing. And I'll say that my love for reading was actively sponsored by my father, who is still an avid reader and would, you know, buy you books after books after books. So um, love of reading. And then I think somewhere in JHS, in between JHS 3 and then, you know, that vacation that we come from waiting for our SHS placements. That was when I started to, I got my hands started on poetry as well. I don't know if it's like that for all of us, but I would all start with poetry. We want to express our feelings or something. But mine was poetry. Some of the poems I'm not very proud of today, but at least like, you know, it was a step. And then one thing led to another. So from poetry, I started trying my hands on short stories. And then I, sometimes I do readaptations, of course, of um, Bible stories that I really love that um, I try to picture myself, and it's one of my favorite adaptations, is, um, the readaptation of the uh, resurrection of Lazarus. I love, love, love it. So it was like that. I love for reading, then sent to poetry, then sent to short stories, and everything writing. So that was how my writing journey started. I think, Laurie, what, what I really like about your submission is how you talk about the role of your parents, because I think that I mean, some of us on this call are parents and it will be good. It's a good starting point because you never know. There are different, we all have different exactly. kinds of children. People's interests are different. And it's something exactly. that it will be really good if you could start inculcating in our children. You know, the, 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 that's something I realized is so different. Like that's one of the differences I realized between we here in Africa and white people. Because, you know, I realized one thing I used to, read these th these things they write for like um how to put a baby to sleep and you know <laughs> these white people like they have like their routine there's always read a bedtime story and i say in africa we don't do that we just sing a lullaby <laughs> and they are gone <laughs> they don't, like read it. but i mean it's a big thing for white people and i think that that is one of the reasons why maybe the way they write is different from the way we write or am i i mean is there is that can you feel that there is that difference or i'm just I, imagining things i think that really you would know when you read something from outside and something from africa i mean how have you seen the comparisons or is there a difference? Do you feel that they are ahead? Or you feel that, well, in spite of we not reading bedtime stories, we are still getting yeah. there. I'm sure some names well, are already coming to your mind. I wouldn't really directly attribute it to maybe their parents reading um, what you call it, bed, bedtime stories to them. I think that I think that it's more of what what brings like what is the major difference between their writing and ours. I think it's just a matter of experiences. Um, when you write an a book written by an African who grew up on the soil, you touch, I mean, you, you touch hands immediately. You're like, this is my person. So I'm not too sure that you can trace, you know, the difference between our writing and their writing to how early they, get, they got started on reading. We could trace other things, but not their style of writing. That's my take on it. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, Mariska, I believe she's told me not to say white people. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to be careful not to say white yeah. people. I'm going to say the one, the one is very sensitive now. She says so I should say Westness or something. So you thank you so much. Well noted. You don't want well to step in any toes. Yes, I'll I'll not be asking you question in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk just about to, just to add to that. I think right. also that um, writers are an extension of the societies they live in and the mm -hmm. societies they are exposed to. And so if you find a typical African writer, you realize that mm -hmm. the things that they write about would be mm -hmm. things close to them, things they grew up okay. seeing. And that is why you can easily identify with their works. Mm -hmm. So it would be 
kind of weird to see a writer, maybe a Ghanaian writer talking about, oh, growing up on the streets of maybe Osu and mm -hmm. then going um, skiing in December. <laughs> you know, so in, yeah, so in the, in the same vein, I think that like the example you gave, it's not too common to see parents, African parents reading bedtime stories to their kids. I, I never had that. And I, I don't think I know anyone who experienced that. So you would see African writers writing about things that they saw growing up or things they heard about happening around. So it's just what's happening in the society that they choose to write about, which is most often than not what they grew up in. Okay. Thank you so much for that wonderful clarification. I would like to now ask if you could share with us your inspiration. Who is your writer that you, you in, that inspires you? Somebody that when you, write, you read the person's works, you find it really inspiring or motivates you or even motivated you at the beginning you know, it's, it's, would you like to share with us, Bene, and then I'll take Laurie and tell us why. <laughs> yeah, like I think I already mentioned, for me, it's uh, without a shred of doubt, Chimamanda Adichie. I think she's just spectacular. She's just glorious. I mean, you read Chimamanda and you, you are just shocked. I mean, you just say, wow. I, her first story that I read was You in America. I mean, it's a short story. I think she put it in the Kane Prize, but unfortunately, she, she didn't win it. But it's such a, a well-written short story. It talks about the, the difficulties that immigrants face in America. But she took it from a different angle, you know? And um, I was so amazed. I was like, this is such a work of art. That's what actually led me to start writing, to try my hands on on short stories, that's what I'm saying. And also I've read a lot of her works, Americana, and you know, and she's just an inspirational writer. And I think that if, if any of us haven't read any of her works, you can look her up. I'm not too crazy about her convictions on certain oh, you know, societal <laughs> you know, issues. You saw that. Yes, but we, we all her, saw that coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but with her writing, though, I think it's spectacular. And it's, it's for any young writer who wants to, who is looking for inspiration, I think you should look at her works. Okay. So I just want you to, like, maybe just point one thing about her style that gets to you. And the way she, I mean, crafts scenes. It, it's it's always different, you know, and um, her choice of words, it, it's not um, too complex, but let me just say, she doesn't use too much, of, she doesn't use big words, but when she strings them together, you realize that this sentence is, you, I mean, you can actually go back and reread a paragraph because she's painting a picture of something that has happened. And the words, I mean, it's just amazing. So I think that I like a narrative style and then a, a choice of words. So these two things help to execute whatever she's planning, the image she's, she's trying to cut across to her audience. So she's kind of a top notch at, at those two things. Yeah, and I agree with you. And I, I, I was about to let Laurie talk, but when you mentioned the big words, anybody who knows me knows that it's one of my <laughs> biggest, like I have a huge problem with it here. I always <laughs> say, always, always. I always tell people that, you know, I know all the big words, but I never use them. So when I see somebody using it, it feels so <laughs> unnatural. I'm, I'm sure there's a place for it, but exactly. if you, you are using it just to impress you know, you just end up confusing people. And I always feel that exactly. when writers are coming out, it's something I say all the time. Every conference I attend, I always say, you know, if you can find a simpler word that somebody understands, let's use that. And yeah. um, your, your skill will be seen in, like what she said, how you're able to string the words together, not in like using big, big, big words, because they end up being like blocks to the understanding yeah. of what you are writing. So I think that's a good one. I couldn't just let it pass. <laughs> and so, Laurie, I will move to you to talk about your inspiration, your writer. 
Okay, um, only one. Do we have to mention only one? No, you can mention as many people as have inspired you. Okay, so I'll go first for David in the Bible because of um, for, for him, it's poetry, like the sounds. You know, I think that when I was answering the question about how I started writing, maybe I should have added the time when I would just pour over the sounds and then job and the language. I'm just stuck in it because I'm like, wow, wow, like this level of expression is so good. So for, you know, King David was in the Bible about how he used to express his emotions to God. I think maybe that is what kind of like helped me to get into poetry, using poetry to be very candid and just, you know, um, say what I feel and, you know, make no apologies for it. And then hmm, this side of the earth, I'll say, um, if I Sutherland, I adore her. I, I just adore her works. I remember I had a chance to meet her daughter once and I nearly embarrassed myself <laughs> because I just went up to her like, oh, you are so school. Your mother, I love your mother. I love your mother. So I think um, her style of writing language is just, whew, I love it. So there's If I Saw the Land and then Amata Edu as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say those are my inspirations. You are heavy on the Ghanaians. Dude. Yeah. You like your roots. I say that <laughs> very much. You like your roots. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that's fantastic. Which books of A Faster the Land or Amata do would you recommend for somebody here that is interested in? Mm, for A Faster the Land, I'll say Edifa. I've been looking for, I lost my copy when we were on campus. And then I think just um, two or three weeks ago, I happened to like find myself in a bookshop and I was like, whatever the price of Edifa is in this bookshop, I'm buying it. And then I turn and then the book is there. I was so happy. So Edifa is a very good one. It's a tragedy. You learn you won't you, you won't comedy, you won't like happy, happy life students. You won't find it in Edifa, but it's still a very good book. And then her marriage of Anansoa is very well written. For Amantai, I guess I love everything she's written. Um, her collection of short stories, that's also very, very good as well. So any of her collections just like all her plays. The level of plays is so you know, let me summarize. There's Edufa, there's Marida Fanansoa, then there's um any collection of Amata in this books, and then um, the level of plays. They are all very, very good. Wow, uh, interesting, amazing. These are these remind me of my uh, days back in school that I used to. I don't know why when I remember this, I just remember learning for exams. Uh. I don't I don't know why people like I able to I, I just study for exams, really. <laughs> you know, I remember I met somebody when the person was like, he really enjoys reading Shakespeare. I'm like, what? <laughs> But I, I find it amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, let's move now into the writing journey and then the challenges that we face. I think it would be a good point to start with. I think that, first of all, there are people on this call, never written, or maybe have interest in writing here and there. And um, I just want to share with us, I mean, what challenges you faced and how you think we can overcome them. And also just to inspire us, I mean, give us a reason, I mean, what we can do to start or why we should even start in the first place. So I will start with Otananama, since Bene has been starting, so I'll just okay. start with it. All right, I remember when I looked at this question, I told myself, ooh, this is a question I'm actually asking my future self, not Laurie today, because I'm still very, very new on the, publishing too. When it comes to amateur writing, yes, writing for my blog or just writing for fun. For that, I can say I have some years experience, but not like for putting my book out there. So, um, I only published, I think, two years ago, and then the second time was last year or something of the sort. But all the same, I think I can say one or two things, and I leave the rest to Ben, who obviously has more experience in that. Um, so first, let me talk about the internal challenges that we face or that I faced as a writer. Um, first is that lack of confidence 
because I, you know, writing for myself, writing for my inner circle, all that is good and well. But when it came to, when I made up my mind that I want to put my story out there, I want to publish it with one of the key, the, you know, challenges was confidence. Halfway through editing, I'll stop and ask myself, who wants to read this? Like, what if nobody buys it? You know, those are the kind of things I used to tell myself. And then I'll be asking myself, is this thing good enough to be published? Is this thing, does anybody want to pay money for this? Yes, your friends read it, they like it, they share comments, but outside, maybe maybe it's because of the relationship that you have with them. Maybe they're just being polite. So that kind of, um, you know, self-doubt was there, is still there, but I'm glad that I didn't let it stop me because if not, I wouldn't even be on this call in the first place. And then um, another thing is when you write and you're waiting on the feedback of others for validation, I realized that if I'm going to keep waiting for that, I'll never really go very far. So I got to that point where I'm like, listen, I'm writing this, I'm submitting it to you know, maybe the opinions or you know, like the inputs of others, but I'm not going to tell myself, okay, I didn't really get a lot of likes, I didn't really get a lot of positive reviews, so maybe this thing is not for me. So those internal battles are really there. And now let me talk about the external challenges to um, writing and publishing. I think one of them would be, um, I hate to put it this way, but I think one of them would be that because we're in Ghana, I mean, the audience is there. Yes, we have a Ghanaian youth that are, I'll say, more and more interested in reading, but we still, I feel like we still have a long way to go, you know, when it comes to that. For example, we don't really have a lot of book clubs. I know there are events organized around writing, but, you know, what is the, what is the level of um, involvement? What's the level of interest that people show in those kind of events. And then another one would be um, for this, let me let me um, drop this experience I had. I called, I, I, I discovered a book of a Ghanaian writer. She had compiled um, stories, real life stories of Ghanaian female prisoners in maximum security prisons. So, you know, that's a very interesting topic. So I, I called her, I, I found a way to get her number. I don't remember how, but I, I got my hands on her number. I called her. I asked her where I could buy her book. And she said, you have to um, order it on Amazon. And I was like, I'm here with you in Ghana. Why should I have to go and get your book <laughs> from Amazon? And she's like, yeah. I don't know how it is. I don't really know where to. She couldn't give me a single shop where I could find her books. So I ended up having to buy her book on Kindle. And then as they were ending the conversation, she asked me, how about you? Are you a writer or you're just like a book lover? I was like, I am a writer. She was like, okay, where do I find your books? I said, um, Amazon. And she's like, okay, so you can relate <laughs> to what I'm saying. Then. So I think that that is one challenge that, but nevertheless, I'm very, very sure that there are publishing houses in Ghana that you know are ready to take on your book, ready to help you publish, ready to get onto the onto um, the shelves of you know bookshops in Ghana, but I think we could do better. I think maybe we could have more of such places, more of such um, you know avenues. So that's all I'll say for the challenges, both internal and external. And I'll leave those to them. All right, Laurie, thank you. That's that's amazing. I think that when you spoke about the internal challenges, I feel that many of us can relate to it in many things. And I'm going to allow Bennett to speak, but after Bennett speaks also, I'm going to open up and just take about two people who would also like to share with us, you know, their comments on the discussion so far, if it's a contribution or a question, because um, I just want to shake things up a bit. So if you have any comments to make on what we've spoken about so far, or you have a personal story to share about your challenge as a writer, and you can just raise your hand and then I'll pick, I'll pick your question or your comments. So I'll take that after Bene. And then my comment on what Loria said will be just like writing everything in life. You always have to overcome the fear of will it work? Will it work? Good question. Will it work? And you always have to overcome that fear just like for writing. So thank you very much, Lori. We'll talk about publishing. Publishing is something that in future, I want to organize a whole session for. So 
it's good you brought it up. I have a number of people that I would like to bring on for that discussion. So that would be it. So Bene, I'll just let you speak. And then if you have something to say at this point, it would be a good time to just raise your hand so that when Bene is done, I will just call you. All right. Okay, so um, challenges faced by young writers. I think that's, for me, uh, first and foremost would be procrastination. And that is a problem. I mean, I think it never leaves, you know, in, in your writing life. So as writers, sometimes you, you have a mental picture of what your story should be, or you probably have an idea how it should begin, and but you, you, you've not figured out the end yet. And so sometimes you can keep postponing when you would actually start writing. And so there's a famous quote, let me just paraphrase that, um, a badly written story can always be edited, but a blank page cannot be edited. So and even on days when um, you think that it's not the ideal time, I mean, as a writer, if you have a target to put out some work or to get some work done, I think that every day you should at least try to write something. And when I started writing, I tried to write 500 words a day. That's not much, but no matter how terrible the, the, the words would be or the passage would be, I realized that at least I had given it some effort. And so procrastination definitely is one thing that um, affects writers, not just um, young writers, but I think that affects all writers. And then secondly, like um, Laurie mentioned, it's self-doubt. Because you're always thinking, am I going to ever be as good as um, the Amatai dudes and then um, the Chino Achibes, because if you look at your writing now, you realize that you compare to them. There's always a propensity to compare yourself to established writers. But what we often forget is that they, were, they also went through a journey that probably took years or even decades to how good they have become now, okay? So the starting of everything is always shaky and it's always not so pretty. But that's something we, 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 we or let me say, I, I um, forgot at the beginning of my writing journey. So I'll tell you a funny story. A friend of mine, somewhere, I think 2012, 2013, he started a website and then a, a writing community. It's called Flash Fiction Ghana. And the whole idea was to get um, stories with a length of a thousand words or under. So just 1,000 words, and you should be able to capture a full story that should make sense and it should be fun to read. So he reached out to people he knew were up and coming writers. And so every week you would publish one on their website. So he reached out to me and I sat back. Those days I just started writing fiction. I mean, a couple of months in. I mean, I had no workouts really, but he knew I was trying my hands on fiction. So I sat back, I think a whole weekend and wrote this story. I, I, I don't quite remember the title, but it was also, I think about a thousand words. And I felt that I'd done the editing, I'd done everything. And it was a, a beautiful story and I sent it to him. So the procedure was he would, he would also um, do his um, phase of editing and give you comments and send it back to you to make some corrections before you know, when, when he's okay with it, then he, he would post it. So I sent the work out to him and then he did his editing and then he sent, he added a comment and brought it back. And after reading the story and the comments, I was so depressed. <laughs> I mean, he had ripped the story apart and I mean, I, I felt like I had just wasted my time. And there was, one comment I'll never forget because I felt that I had really put in a funny line and a funny paragraph and it ended with a very good funny line. And his comment was, um, that was a cheap attempt at comedy. <laughs> and I know that, I mean, obviously he has experience in editing. So it was a very objective work done, but it just hit me. And I remember that day I sat back and I was like, Charlie, Maybe this writing thing is really not for me. But um, I think that, so I didn't submit it 
for that particular week's publication, but I went back to it later on when I was okay. But looking back, I realized that a few years down the line, I mean, I write a story and I put it out there and people are so amazed and people give me positive feedback. And we'll get into how I, I got into publishing some of my works, but I realized that even I've, I've received positive feedback from quite a number of established writers. And so it lets me think that, oh, if I had given up then, then I wouldn't actually know how good I would become at this writing thing. And so I, I believe it's, it's a story that resonates with a lot of writers. So the beginning is it, not just peculiar to just writing, but just like any other industry or, or artisanship, the beginning is not so pretty. And so we don't focus on the weaknesses that are showing up in the beginning, but you should have the mentality that you are going to improve day in, day out, and you are going to show up and at least try to write something given the timeline that you have given to yourself. Okay, so that's what I have to say regarding that. Bene, what's your yeah. inspiration? I can already <laughs> see two, two hands up, but I just want to make a comment because whilst you were speaking about getting that feedback, it reminded me of my own life. <laughs> okay. And how, you know, any, anybody who knows me, I'm a copywriter, that's the work that I do. But okay. I have a boss who is 100 times better than I am. So you can imagine when you write. <laughs> I mean, she has 1 million angles from which she can't see the writing. And that, that time yeah. you feel like you put in so much. And then she just punches holes. And you know, at first when I started, it used to be frustrating. Like, when will I ever get, I mean, produce something and this lady will be like, wow, wonderful, let me find. It never happens. <laughs> She always has like a way that she goes about. But as I followed her correction, her feedback, instruction over the years, I realized I'm actually 100 times better than I was. I mean, I'm not up to her level, but feedback is so, so, so important. Anything that you, you do, always make sure that you get people's opinions, people to tell you this is good. It helps. You may feel like, oh, that's really depressing, disheartening. But sometimes... The people who tell you the truth are the people who love you the most. So they yeah. tell you this is not good enough. And you feel like, ah, do you know how I suffered to do it? It doesn't matter. You try again and it comes out better. That's my yeah. own contribution to this. So Jennifer and Mohammed, I'm going to ask you to unmute. And then you can come on video if you want. If not, you can just speak. And then please feel free to share with us what you want to share with us. Right. Um, hello, everyone. So um, I've just been listening to this conversation. Um, personally, I'm not I'm not a writer myself. But then, um, when when I was in high school, I went through various stages or some kind of challenge where um, I came from one high school that was not so good for me, and I struggled with vocabulary and just normal sentence structure and all of that, and when I moved or I, I shifted schools, I felt a lot of people were better than me in my class um, in writing in general. Um, the teachers used to make fun of me. Um, even my brother and sister who are younger than me were better writers and better spellers than, than I am. Um, but then, I mean, with this whole conversation, I see how I went, I, I, I sailed through in a sense that um, no one told me how to write, but then I decided to approach things in a very simplified way. I started, instead of complex sentences, I started using simple sentences to convey ideas. And um, I, I also started using like a more simplified vocab vocabulary set. Yeah. And after I finished writing my IGCSE or O level, um, I noticed the final score I had were, was the same as those who were the top scorers in my class. And <laughs> like th that, that just goes to show how really writing in a very simplified way to get what you want to see across is very, very essential. Mm. True. Wow. Is that Mohammed? Yes, please. Ah, I love yeah. you. you. You speak yeah. fantastic English. I love it. If I can comment on that. Yes, please do. Yes, I, I think that um, 
people often confuse who their audience is. And so I think that in Ghana also, there is a perception that if you speak, if you speak in a complicated way, if you use, let me say, big English, then it means that you are good, you know? But um, if um, you speak in a way that your listeners are not able to understand what you are saying, then you are not communicating well. So in the same vein, if you are writing and then your diction is too complicated for the, your readers, then really you are losing them. Because I don't know anyone who would read a book or a short story and, and put a dictionary beside it, you know, to be looking up words. One or two, fine. But then if it becomes quite a, a number in a paragraph, then really the person is better off dropping the book. And I think that, yeah, it's, 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 it's a very practical story. And I think that is something that we should all learn, that we learn, let me say big words for a reason, but you don't communicate to everyone in the same vein. You know, you must know your audience. That it also has, it. if you go into the academia, if you go into, um, let's say we are doing a PhD in literature, I mean, obviously the, the, the scale would go higher. And so the people you would, you would encounter, your professors and all that, would also expect that you speak in a certain way. No, probably not speak, but then tender in maybe assignments or projects in a certain way. But if you should know your audience, everyday conversations and know how to speak to people. Yeah. Thank you, Bene. I see um, Ebenezer, Rudolph, and Raymond. So I'm going to take Ebenezer and Rudolph. And Raymond, we just hold on for me so that I can. So really, sorry, Raymond, you just raised your hand, really. <laughs> I was just targeting Ebenezer. So Aben, I'm going to ask you to unmute, and then you can just address us. All right. Good evening, MFA, and good evening Hi. to everyone. Um, yeah. mine, mine is a question. Uh, but before the question, let me uh, comment uh, Laurie's dad. Um, I'm also a father, so at least I've learned a lesson. Yeah, I've taken a cue from what his dad did, at least introducing him to reading. I believe it's something um, worth emulating. So that is the first one. And my question has to do with, um, Benny was talking about his dislike for um, using the big, big book apps when he's reading. And I think MFA also said same. But let me ask, so um, as a writer, um, when you throw in the big book apps, uh, I, yeah, I know Ben mentioned that yeah, you have to know your audience and all that. But, but at least once in a while, I, when 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 do you think it's appropriate as a writer to introduce a new word, a big book up? Um, so that, that's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you, your question is fantastic, <laughs> Ben. You're going to have to answer this question. Yeah, no problem. So I think that um, there's nothing wrong with using big vocabulary once in a while, as long as, like I said, you are communicating. Because the purpose of writing or reading is one, to educate and also to entertain. So you should have a good time reading a short story or a book, but you should also learn one or two words. You should improve your vocabulary by reading. The problem arises when you cannot make headway in, let's say you take a paragraph and there are so many big words that you don't even know what the writer is talking about. Bear in mind, if I, if I let's say, give you a sentence or a paragraph and I introduce a big word that you've not even encountered before, based on the context, you can correctly guess the meaning of the word, right? But in that same paragraph, if there are four or five others like that, you realize that you become confused. You get it. So my point is not the total, you know, not, not deciding not to use big words at all, but there must be a balance and there must be measured. You must be measured in using them. Ensure that whenever you use them, I mean, you do not throw the, the reader off. You get it. So. I have a problem with 
within a, a, a just I always use a paragraph, and then in a paragraph, I have about four or five words I have to look up. Then you are you are losing me. But let's say if even every paragraph I encounter a word I'm not too sure about, it's okay. We get it. It's all about communication, like I said. You must ensure that the, the aim of every writer is that once a reader picks up your book, you should be able to hold the reader's attention to the end of the book. You get it. And so introducing all these things can let you lose the reader. Okay, I hope I hope I've made my point clear. All right, all right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Rudolf, Rudolf, let's hear from you and then we'll continue the conversation. Cue to unmute. Hello, everyone. Hi. Yeah. This is uh, Rudolf, and I'm joining you from Monrovia, Liberia. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> Good to have uh, you on the call. Yeah, thank you. I was uh, a former student of Mr. Ben Mekro at Academic City College in, oh. in Ghana, in Accra. Wonderful. But first of all, I would like to say thank you to the organizers of this platform. But my thing is a question more because I want to know what are some of the processes or procedures for those that are interested in writing? What do they do? So for those of you that are, if I may say, professional writers already, what do you tell young writers? What are some of the steps that they can take in order to do good writing? All right, thank, thank you, Rudolph. I'm going to throw it to Lori, since Benet has been speaking for a while. So Lori, let's just hear you. Um, if I understand, his question is about how you start writing. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, um, I think I'll just retrace back to my introduction when I said that I think uh, the love and then the skill for writing will come from a love of reading the more you read you know if you listen to um, Bennett's introduction as well he mentioned that it was actually when he read Chimamanda's works that he also um, you know got that flair for or even the interest to try his hands on short stories so I think first of all it starts with reading a lot reading the kind of um, material you want to write. So if you're not interested in academic reading, maybe you shouldn't spend too much time in that. But if it's fiction you want to try, if it's thrillers you want to try and hands on, if it's short stories you want to try and hands on, then, you know, devour short stories and devour thrillers. That way you're picking up, um, you're picking up some tips from what you are writing. Now, after you've read, 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 and you're ready to, to write, I'd say that one of the things you need to do is to sit and write. I know it sounds very simple, but it's because um, we we have a lot of, I'm sure if you ask Ben how many uncooked or how many, how big stories are in his mind, he has a number. I have a number in my mind, on paper, on my phone, on my laptop, everywhere. How how stories? Why are they not finished? Lack of discipline and procrastination. It's as simple as that. And then as well as finding the time. So you've read, read, read. Now you want to sit and write. Make that decision. I don't know, whatever. Um, I was telling somebody this afternoon that I think that writing also is not just the mental space, but then creating the right environment is very important because if, let's say, mentally you're ready to write, but you're not finding the place, the, the, you know, the physical space to sit and say, this is going to be my writing this, you know, these are my materials and schedule a time. I want to sit, I want to write something. So you do that, you get the discipline packed down, you get the time, you get the mental space, everything you need. The next thing is to submit your work to other people for input because I used to be very jealous over my, if, if I write and I show it to you, then you are super special. I would not just give my writing to anybody because I don't know, it, I just said it like, it's because when I write, I'm very honest with my very, like, I'm honest and I'm raw. I've had that comment from somebody before that. When I write, I'm really raw and I don't hold back. That's my style. So giving my work to just anybody was very, very hard for me because it's almost like you meeting me on an intimate level and getting to know 
the law written side, not the social law, but the real law. So that was something that I was very, very reluctant to do. But I realized until you submit it to people and get their feedback, you're not going to grow. Until you you put that, um, you know, oh, this is my project. I don't want anybody to watch. Don't want to see it. Then you probably shouldn't be right. So I think that's it. So loud reading, find a mental space and the, you know, the environment, sit and write, and then get people to give you their feedback. And then immerse yourself in, you know, um, environments where your gifts will be nurtured. And events like this is very good because we're all talking about, right? So it fires you up. I bet as you are talking, some people are already, you know, cooking up stories that, you know, at the back of their minds and all that. So yeah. that is what, that is what I have to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Laurie. Okay. So Raymond, I've already told you we'll take your questions later. So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, time is fast running out. So I'm going to just ask two questions, two more questions. And then I will take my last batch of questions from the participants and then we'll do your give away and then we can call it a day all right i think that will work so let's give ourselves up to seven tops i think seven tops we should be out of here so just hold on for us seven tops we should be out of here all right so my next question is now going to be about um marketing your book putting yourself and your book out there um I know that you are not full-time writers. I know that you do different things on the side. And that's for everybody to know. They are not full-time writers. They have their own lives and all that. But I also want to know, so what advice do you have for putting your book out there? How was your, your approach like? Are you um, the laid-back type? Maybe because it's not your main source of income, you have just relaxed about it. But somebody wants to know if I want to put my book out there for people to buy um, from publishing to marketing? What do I need to keep in mind? How do I do that? I think that I will just start from, I think Laurie, you want to say something? And then yeah, Bene will also say something. Okay, you want me to answer yes, that? You, yes, yes. And I prefer for Bene to go because <laughs> I feel like, yeah, I feel okay, like it's all right. It's, a, to say it's all right, Bene, let's hear you. Yeah, okay. So, um, putting your book out there, if you actually get to the stage where you have a full manuscript, then you have to think of who is going to read this or who is going to buy this. And um, as far as I know, there are two options. You know, many people blur the lines, but we have um, self-publishing, which is much more common in Ghana and Sub-Saharan Africa. And then we have the traditional publishers. So the difference is that the self, with the self-publishing, you are putting the bill for virtually everything. So the pub printing, publishing, marketing, you are going to handle all that. And then with the traditional publishers, they will choose you. So you submit your works to the traditional publisher and then um, based on if, if you meet their bill, then they decide that, okay, I'm going to publish a book for you. And for a lot of um, established writers, that's, you call it a creme de la creme. That's where everybody looks up to because they would now write you a check. And so you have big name authors writing million dollar book deals because the publisher, let's say, and Penguin Books, they want, to, they also compete because they're also looking for talent. And so they will say, okay, I'll give you a million dollars for to publish this book and distribute worldwide. If you are lucky enough to get such a deal, then you are good because they are going to do the marketing, they are going to do the distribution. All you have to do is to write a book and submit it. And in 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 Western um, countries, you don't even go directly to them; you go through agents. So that's for traditional publishers. In Africa, we have quite a number. I know of Cassava Republic in Nigeria and Weeda Books. I don't know of any in Ghana yet. But what is much more common to young writers, because you also have, a, have to build an audience, is self-publishing. And even that has different forms. So what basically what you have to think of is um, you have to research, okay, and see the options available to you. Their resources available to you. 
okay and they are um, good self self publishing companies in ghana one that i know of is book Nook. they will do the publishing and they would even assist with the marketing but if you are going to do everything on your own then you need to look at i have a plan who is going to be my first hundred buyers probably um at the launch you are projecting you're going to get 100 buyers then moving forward how do i scale it up to a thousand so everything is going to depend on you okay so basically i would say that what you have to do is to research for the up what kind of publishing you are looking out for and then who you need to speak to and speak to other writers who have done it before and so they can show you an easier way okay writing taking your being out there is all about networking also the opportunities that um, you might not hear of until someone prompts you so i would say do your research and then decide which kind of publishing you are going for and be ready to put in the work yes yeah. i think you have also been in some writing workshops i i i figured yes like yes a... i have and that has helped me a lot you know mm -hmm. Um, the first workshop I was in was Moisa writing workshop. And so there was a, a call for submissions for, I think that was the, the first time they were doing it. And so Writers Project Ghana. Another important thing is as a writer, you, you should follow some of these um, writing communities. So Writers Project Ghana, they do a lot of work. They even have a road show every Sunday evening, I think at 8 p.m. on City, City FM, where they just talk about writing and creative arts and all that. I've been on the show for a couple of times. So they just invite writers. So Writers Project um, put out this um, blast that they are receiving submissions for a new writing workshop called Moisa, fully funded. And um, I submitted a story. They were looking for, I think, seven people. And luckily enough, I was I was, I was, I was picked. So it was, a, it ran for five months. So Saturdays we would meet at their office in North Legon. And we had experienced writers like Nia Ikwe Parks, I don't know if you know him, and Martin Eblewebe. So they took us through, I mean, a whole lot. They drilled us, punch holes in our writing. And then for five months. So I realized that after that period, I had become maybe 10 times better as a writer. And it was at that point that I decided, okay, I think that it's time to start working on a collection of short stories. So I had stories scattered on my PC. I just reworked them, combined them and decided to publish. Okay, so workshops are, I mean, you, you would hear of them. And the good thing is once you attend one of these, like I said, networking is very important. You would hear of the next opportunity and the next, and so, I was also called that, um, okay, good institute is doing something for writers across Africa. And so they are asking for submissions. And also, so I actually wrote a story overnight and submitted it and they were looking for two people. So there was a short list of, I think 10 people. And then they called us into an Accra workshop. By the way, also workshops scattered across Africa, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and then out of it, they submit, they, they, there were six workshops and then they, they selected two stories from each country. And I was also picked from Ghana. So we're two writers from Ghana and they, they, they published that book. So I have the book here, What Are Links? Oh yeah, so it's a very good book. They published everything. And uh, this was the book that was translated in, in Swahili and French. And that was in 2019. And the good thing is they also invited us to the RK Festival in Nigeria, fully paid trip, you know. But my point is, you will not have heard of this on the news or even on the internet. It was someone who told me about this opportunity. So it's very critical that as a writer, you expose yourself to writing communities because when there are opportunities, you might not hear of them, you know, in traditional media. Yeah. Oh, Benedict, what a wonderful point there yeah. that any industry you find yourself in, try and just open yourself up so that you can know what's going on. Thank you. Laurie, yeah. let's hear you. 
Okay, so on this, um, I think Bena has said everything. So I'll just emphasize, what I'll do is just emphasize some of the points because I cannot think of what he's let out. <laughs> so all I'm going to do is perch on your submission. And um, the parts where you talk about networking, I think that's very, very important. Um, when I refer when you're asking this question, you said something, I did the laid back, that would be me, the laid back one who, like who wrote and then it's like, oh, I'll get back to this later. <laughs> but it's funny that as um, Bennett is speaking, I am taking notes as well because I'm like, oh, yeah, Laurie, you really should be doing this, you really should be doing that. So the parts where, you know, like I said, putting your work out there is, is, is important and then getting, um, getting yourself involved in those communities where they talk writing, they talk publishing, you know, so that when opportunities come, you hear about them. I think um, my the, the anthology that my story was selected for, that was in 2018, I believe. I think I just did a, a random Google search for writing contests because I, I felt like, oh, I got to the place where I wanted my writing to, you know, skip the borders of Ghana. So I, I found Africa Book Club, I think, yeah, that was the name, Africa Book Club Anthology or something of the sort, submitted my story. Thankfully, my story was selected. And that was the first thing. And I think that was what even gave me that push that, wow, the story made it a book. Okay, you're not that bad. Like, you know, give yourself another yeah. push, you know, um, push yourself better. So I'd say that, yeah, get yourself involved out there and then look for the opportunities like I did. You can do a Google search, look for contests, um, look for, like you said, writing workshops and all that. And it will, it will really like, give you that, it will encourage you, it will give you that push to get yourself out there even more. Thank all right, thank you. What I would just like to add, when you guys were speaking, I just wanted to add that um, somebody came to see me this, um, this Sunday. He was like, oh, I've seen your event. I like writing, but I've not been able to write. You know, what should I do? And I think that one of the things that I told him was start a blog. Start a blog. And I think that, you know, if you want to write, for example, you want to start, you want to put yourself out there. Sometimes I feel that you may get more people knowing you before your book actually comes out by having a blog. So there you can put like shorter things, get a following, go online. And when I say a blog, I mean like, like a, a site, an online site where you put, and most of us use WordPress, yeah. you know, where you put short, short articles and pieces and things. Yeah. What happens is that people read it. And so people go like, oh, this girl can't, this girl is good, this guy is good. So by the time you even come out with your book, you know, to even push it out, someone will be like, ah, I used to read this girl's blog or this guy's blog. I think yeah. the person is good, you know, and that's just what I, I would add. I don't, I don't know. I'm not supposed to be adding things, but I oh, keep yeah. adding them. <laughs> <laughs> <Same too. laughs> I'm, I well, keep adding them. All right. So my you. final question to you, and then I will take any other questions or contributions. So this is your opportunity. If you have something to say or to write, I see really positive comments in the chat. And really, thank you. Thank you. But if you have more contributions or questions, we'll take them after this. So my last question to be will be to you will be on the story writing process since you are you are fiction writers and i would ask you to tell me your top three tips for a powerful story what you you always try to include when you write or what you see in people's books that you feel that ha huh, this is so great so for someone who wants to write who is going into writing. And even if it's not fiction, a story is always powerful. So how can we say three tips that you have employed over the years to push your story out there? And I will be noting it. All right. So mm -hmm. who's going first? Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll do. Okay. Thank I'll you. Be Maybe because um, out of all the questions you sent, like that we should prepare. This was the most exciting for me. So I just didn't wait for us to get there. So the first thing I'd say um, that makes a good short story, I think you should have the language you engage in. For me, I don't know whether it's a personal thing. Is it because I enjoy like stories when the writers use very good language? Maybe
maybe it's a personal thing, but engaging language is very important because there's no story you're about to write that has not been told before. There's a similar thing somewhere. You know, your plot may be, you know, different, unpredictable, but the very, like, content of your story or, like, you know, the general framework of your story has been written by someone before. So your language should be engaging enough to keep us glued to your, like Vene rightly said that um, you are writing to retain the attention of your audience. So you need to avoid monotony. And um, this is not inside you between MFI and I, I don't know if you should remember, but uh, we had to edit someone's fiction work once and the person you saw tea, I don't know how many times in that story, um, so, I remember, so, so, Laurie. You remember? <laughs> How could I he forget? Got soft tea. He sat down softly. She had him softly, and they went home softly. I was like, we should just name this book the soft book. Yeah. You need to find, <laughs> you need to find synonyms, a better way of putting things. Um, you need to find even for now we're lucky. There's there's an online dictionary, a collocation dictionary that you put in any word and it gives you the words that normally go with those words so that you don't end up saying unnatural things. Just because I'm saying you should avoid monotony, you do a quick um, synonym search on Microsoft Word. Those synonyms, they give are not really synonyms because they each have their context. And then you just swap the one that sounds the best. You're going to end up with an unnatural sounding story. So you need to avoid um, monotony in your language. And then, um, you should be bold, you should be creative with language as well. I like it when I read works of people that don't really like, um, it's not like you're ignoring the rules of grammar or that you're borrowing a poetic license, but you're creative in your use of language. And now you use it as an adjective. So long as you understand it clearly, even if you're the first person to use it as an adjective, it's nice because we've never had anybody use, you know, the word in that, you know, change the function of that word before. So your language should be creative enough. Your language should be, um, you know, you should feel free. And especially, this one is very personal because I'm such a you know, proud Ghanaian. I don't mind doing transliterations in my writing. I always feel like I don't, at first I would write something and then I'll be thinking of, oh, how about my international writing? I'm like, okay, fine, international reader, sorry. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll just leave a footnote. But there are some times when, no, I want you to get the Ghanaian, Ghanaian-ness of my story. So if I have to use an expression that's very Ghanaian, that is not known elsewhere, I will use it. And you, dear reader, do your Google search and welcome to Ghana. So you should be bold in your use of language. You should be creative in your use of language and you should avoid monotony. The second thing I would say makes um, a great short story or any story for that matter, is that your characters should be um, human, as human as possible. Once again, I remember a fiction work I edited and the main character was practically an angel, made no bad decisions, made no mistakes from A to Z of the story. Like, he, she was too perfect. In my comments, I told the person, this, this character of yours is uh, the favorite of the gods. I can see you have a personal attachment. I heard it's somebody you know in real life that you've transported into your book. But you know, let us see. Let make your character as human and as uh, relatable as possible. Also, put your characters under um, enough pressure to make the story engaging. When you put characters in conflict, that will get the readers scratching their head. Like, what would I have done in this situation? It makes it a very, very because we're in a hurry to know what next. What next? Is he going to act like me? Is he going? What's he? What's he going to do? So I think putting your characters and uh, pressure, which giving them a very, very well-planned conflict is important. And lastly, I'll say that your book should not be, your plot should not be so predictable from page one. There's a collection of short stories I'm reading currently on Kindle. One of them, I picked it up on page one. I already have the name of the woman and the man. I can already tell they were married by the time I'm done with the book. There was no, you know, background, they could even start with, you know, some, some, I don't know, the story just starts, he's in a coffee shop, he raises her head, there she is. I can predict the rest of the story, especially since I know I'm reading a Christian romance collection. So I think that it's important not to let your story be so predictable from page one, so that, you know, readers have a reason to keep flipping, read, read 
just have a reason to keep, you know, you can't wait to get back with your book. That's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laurie. I was trying to answer a question in the chat. Okay, Bene, please, over to you. Okay, so I top three tips for a good short story or a good story. I think that first and foremost, there must be a clear cut identifiable theme. You know, the message must be clear. I mean, I think that you would have shortchanged your readers if they end up reading your story and asking, ah, so what is it? What is this story actually about? <laughs> what is the author trying to communicate, you know? And um, probably maybe I've not seen a story like that, but I've, I've actually watched the movie where I wondered that well, what exactly is going on at the end of the movie, you know? So if it's a short story, then you wouldn't want to have more than one thing, you know, because, you know, you have a limited time, limited scope to convey a story. But if it's a longer work of maybe a novel, then there's a possibility of having multiple themes, you know? But definitely, whether it's one or multiple, depending on the length of the, the, the work, it should be clear. We are talking about love. It shouldn't be spelled out, but the reader should be able to pick the message you are trying to convey. So for me, there must be one, an identifiable theme. And then secondly, I think that there should be conflict of some sort. Yeah. You know, yeah. we cannot write a story of um, maybe probably my typical day of work. I wake up, I, I take my shower, I go to work, eat, come back, <laughs> sleep, end of story. <laughs> I mean, you, you've described my day, but I mean, why would I read something like that? So you realize that a good story has some form of conflict, either the conflict of the, the an individual with society or an individual with another individual or sometimes an individual with himself. There's always some sort of conflict that and so people are drawn towards the conflict and they want to know what happens next. How is it going to be resolved? Probably um, somebody is being chased or for a murder or someone is fleeing the love of his life, there is always some form of conflict. And the stronger the conflict, the more you realize that people are drawn towards the story and they want to know how it ends, what happens next, what happens on the next page, you know? So for me, the theme must be clear, the conflict must exist, either a conflict with the individual I said, or the society or with another person. And then also I think that, um, your characterization must be done well in the sense that you must create characters that people are drawn to, you know? And then um, people will be drawn to characters for only two reasons. Either they love the character or they hate the character. <laughs> yeah, it's one, one or the other. So they must either love your protagonist or they hate him so much that they want to know what will happen at the end. And that's the only way to, to get a powerful story or to keep them reading. I'll give you two examples. If you read Oliver Twist, you realize that people are drawn to Oliver Twist because of his struggles, you know? They feel sad for him. They feel empathetic towards him. They feel that it, they want to know if there's gonna be a brighter day at the end of the tunnel. And so all the struggles he goes through in the course of the book, a big book, you, 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 all, you feel sad. How can a, a, a poor orphan, you know, go through such harsh, I mean, conditions of life? And that's what draws you to the book. You want to know what happens next. Is he going to survive? Is he going to flee from the men that are chasing him to, to kidnap him, you know? And so the conflict exists, but you love the character for, for his ability to, overcome his situation. And then secondly, you know, there's this book, um, Animal Farm. I don't know how many of us have read it. And you realize that people love the book. I love the book because I hated the protagonist. That was, it's a book about animals, it's a fable. And um, it's, 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 it's a mirror, it's, it mirrors our society where 
Um, it was written uh, probably a century ago, but the people wanted to, the animals wanted freedom from their human owners, okay? So they devised a plan to house them so that they can run the farm themselves. And when they were able to, 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 to gain independence, sort of, they realized that, oh, they need some form of authority. But they were going to share the, how the, the farm went equally. So there was this popular phrase, all animals are created equal. Okay, so that's somewhere in the middle of the book. So they, they say the strongest animal, which is the horse, was going to drag the, the mower and, and all that. But it got to a point where the pigs were in, in charge and they realized that they started reducing their workload. So all the other animals were doing much more work and they were doing about 10% of the work. And they kept reducing it to the point where they were not working at all. Because they were, the, in the book, they were the smartest of them all. And so all they did was to eat and have parties, but they did that at the blind side of all the other animals, okay? And so when you read the book, you hate what the pigs are doing so much because it, it's like they were duping everyone else. And when they were eventually confronted, they made a statement that, yes, all animals are created equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And you see, this is an old book, but you can see that this, that's what happens in society where certain people who gain political power enrich themselves and their families. And so these are just two examples that drew me to two different books. You must either love the character. So try to create characters that your readers will love so much that they would want to know what happens next to them. Or they would hate so much that they would want to know if they eventually you know, are punished for their deeds. Yeah, I think that's my take on, on that. All right, thank you. Yeah. I was trying to put my points together on my slide. I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, uh, I think I saw it. I was it. trying to put the points together for me too. That's also what I'm taking away for today. So you want a powerful story. The language must be engaging. The characters must be relatable. The plot shouldn't be predictable. The themes should be clear. There should be conflict of a sort and yeah. you should do your characterization well. Either the protagonist is loved or hated in the words yeah. of Benet himself. So thank exactly. you so much. I think I'm gonna end it here. My time is almost up and it's oh. getting late, but I have really enjoyed my, this went better than I was expecting. I mean, oh, really? in terms of um, even people, the kind of feedback that they are giving and the kind of responses I'm getting from you, Laurie and Bennett, it's been fantastic. So I would just give the opportunity for um, a few people to ask their questions or their comments. Let me stop sharing screen and then let me go also to the chat and see. So someone was asking for an illustrator. I think someone also put in that he had a good illustrator. So if it's you, I would just use the opportunity to tell you to reach out to the person so that I think you can drop the number of your illustrator in the chat so that we can get it to the person who is requesting that. That would be it. And then if you have any question, please raise your hand or a contribution, a comment. We are almost out of here. So I would just, is Raymond still around? He wanted to say something earlier. Good, Raymond. Thank okay, you. please. Let's hear you. Yes, good evening. Yeah. Hello. Yes, um, it's wonderful to have uh, like-minded individuals gathered here on this platform. Uh, I feel so proud seeing my old school meets organizing this. I'm very, very happy. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, this question. Um, I've, I've, I've been writing, let me see, I've been writing, but um, I realized that I encounter, or I have this block sometimes, and I understand it's called a writer's block. And uh, most of the time I stop writing, I'm like, I'll come back to it. But the truth is, I never actually come back to it. So <laughs> months later, years, sometimes years later, 